y'all doing? All right. Um, so, you know, my question through this whole thing was, was I going to just sort of talk without words, without it being written down, or with it being written down? And I decided, well, I'm a professor, <laughs> so I lecture. And I'm a writer, so I write. And if I just talked, we would be here till about two. <laughs> so I do have it here. And the complication there is like about two days ago, I thought, oh yeah, sure, I'll throw some slides in too. So let's see if I can navigate through slides and a bunch of paper up here. So yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks, Nathan. Can y'all hear me? Thanks, Janera. This is really a wonderful spot. I've been to a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, certainly a treasure of the neighborhood and treasure of Pittsburgh. I won't get into other competitive spaces. I'll just say most of the stuff you see that's good, will happen here. All right, so uh, I'm gonna try not to look. I also spent like a week just trying to memorize a poem only to print it out, so. <laughs> I was really thinking I'm gonna show you how I've memorized some stuff. Uh, but if I could memorize things, I wouldn't be a writer. All right, um, so there's some drawings. That's one. Uh, is that me crying language or sweating language or seeing anything but words? And there are other people's work. I'll try where possible to, uh, to tell you who it is. And I, I can't remember what happens at the end if we're doing a Q&A or anything. But let me get my timer set. So as I said, I'll make sure I'm not keeping you out too long. So I want to talk about language, the effect it has on us, uh, the effect we have on it. There's this dude, Hakeem Bey, uh, and this idea of act, only acts of poetical terrorism, he calls it. And all I know is I saw it, and I think I actually saw it in a bookstore in Belgium, and I was like, oh, I'm going to put that on my wall. So I have it. And it's really just about provocation and surprise, and so that's sort of sprinkled through there as another way of thinking about language. But I think what I really want to start with is just a story of me uh, walking in a northern city industrial city like Pittsburgh, except without the Steelers, which is bad. It wasn't Buffalo, but someplace like Buffalo, um, which is sad. <laughs> With a famous writer, I had go gone up there and I had read, uh, this is a couple of years ago, and we were leaving, and she's a southerner like I am, but you know, she's from Texas, I'm from South Carolina, she's white, she's about uh, a year younger than my mom. And so she was really, you know, being a mother, kind of. And she was like, uh, or a motherfucker. And she was like, um, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. The poems that she understood that I read, and if you've ever heard me read, this maybe makes sense, were fine. I do like to tell a story. I like a narrative poem. And then the other poems, because I do like to get a little bit wild sometimes. She was like, that little navel-gazing stuff, that, that just doesn't work. You should just drop all of those poems. And then, so, you know, essentially she was saying the poems are, are for you. I mean, the poems are for the reader. They're not for, for you to sort of play around with. They're not for you to, to, to play with your food, to, to make a bunch of stuff going on that's boring and not understood for people. So then I was like, well, uh, I like Ashbery. You know, I like John Ashbery. And she was like, instantly, tell me a poem. Tell me one of his poems. And I was like, well, I don't actually know any of his poems. I like the idea of John Ashbery. I don't know. Who knows? He's like the David Lynch of poetry, if you don't know who I'm talking about. And uh, she said, well, if you can't remember any of the poems, that's the first sign that it's a bullshit poem and probably a bullshit poet. And then and she, wasn't, she wasn't bullshitting, so this is what I tried to do. I was like, she memorized that poem. So all week, I spent the time trying to memorize this poem. That was John Baldessari, a piece of art that uh, Art should, I always showed it to my students on the first day of class, you know, I will not make any more boring art, that's your pledge. Uh, so she, I was like, uh, 
Yeah, you know, like I like some good poems. I like some poets. I like John Ashbery, uh, Dream Song. He's got about 77 Dream Songs that won the Pulitzer in the 60s before he committed suicide. But this one is just crazy. I've never taught it. So I'm saying to her uh, earlier in the day, before this talk, before this walk, that I really like Dream Song 14. And she instantly went into it. So this is a, this is a meta comment. What I really wanted to do initially for y'all was to come out and before doing anything, just begin by saying, life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. Uh, see, so that's what I mean. Let me look at it. <laughs> After all, the sky flashes, the great sea yearns, we ourselves flash and yearn. And moreover, my mother told me repeatedly as a boy, ever to confess you're bored means you have no inner resources. I conclude now I have no inner resources because I am heavy bored. Peoples bore me, literature bores me, especially great literature. Henry bores me with his plights and gripes as bad as Achilles, who loves people and valiant art, which bores me. And the tranquil hills and gin look like a drag, and somehow a dog has taken itself and its tail considerably away into mountains or sea or sky, leaving behind me wag. So what you have to think about is like I'm just walking with a you know, famous skinny white lady with a great southern accent. And I say, I like that poem. And she just goes off. She just says it. So fast forward again just an hour or so after that. And she's saying to me, can you do that with John Ashbery if you think he's so hot? And I'm like, no, I can't. So she says, that's why he's not worth your time. But when she did that, when she memorized that, said that poem that way, I thought first, I'm going to try to do it. I'm still working on it. And I also thought, we're going to be friends. We're going to be good friends. So what she's suggesting is the reader is there, the audience is there to have dinner with you. They're not there to watch you eat. That's essentially what she meant anyway. It's not what she said. And I thought, that's a pretty interesting idea. And what I should have said was, well, isn't Asbury just kind of playing with his food, playing with his noodles, in fact. When you think about like the end of that poem, you know, on the tranquil hills and gin look like a drag and somehow a dog, all through that. I'm like, what's going on at the end of that poem? But I still feel like it's, you know, it's nutritious. It's like there's something in terms of the imagination that's working there at the end of that poem, even though I don't know what it means. So what I should have said is if a writer only feeds his guest, he'll starve. So think about it. It's like you show up and I'm only giving you the food that I prepared. I'm going to starve. But it's also true if I don't eat and I'm feeding you, you should be suspicious because I might be poisoning you. You don't know what it is. So if you think about that in terms of the relationship of we are kind of having a meal together and we're, we're still, we're talking about language. We're talking about the principle of art, so to speak. So anyway, so we reached the restaurant and her grad students are there. And the image I have are of her shoes. First of all, she's got these stilettos on. So every time she's walking, it's like she's stabbing the sidewalk. And then the students, they have like little tiny mouths because they've been like, you know, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. And these big old ears so they can be like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. So what I felt like, oh, my mouth's getting smaller and my ears are getting bigger too. I'm, I'm becoming one of her students just by agreeing with her. So uh, what I should have said to her is that there is joy in mystery. And Ashbury himself is a kind of mystery. And reading the poems is sort of like looking down into his head, the head of an 80 year old uh, white dude, which is interesting. You know, you don't think that's interesting, but really anybody's head is pretty interesting if you can get down into it. And I feel like that listening to, to musicians, Lil Wayne, I think that like when I hear him, there's some loose noodles going, you know, before he got like really crazy with the syrup and the smoke, you know, the syrup. So now when I look down in it, that's all I see is cough syrup and, and weed smoke. But when he was a little bit younger, I thought, that's what I love in Lil Wayne. Bjork, it's what I love. Radiohead, MF Doom, if you know what I'm talking about. Ziggy Stardust, rest in peace. You know, like thinking about, if you think about that record in particular, there's something mysterious and joyful about the way these people are using language. So it's not that they're telling stories. Any, none of the people I said are what I call storytellers, but they are conveying feeling and ideas in their language. So anyway, I didn't say all of that, but that's sort of what I was thinking as we entered in the restaurant. That's one of my drawings. I can't say much about it. But there'll be others, and then I'll explain them to you. So this is uh, me thinking about 
the progression of language, the evolution of language, moving <laughs> from, from big statements. I wanted that to be, I wanted that to be Lil Wayne at the end, because Lil John is kind of interesting, but he's actually, he makes sense actually, so I'm not so interested in Lil John, because I feel like even the what is kind of narrative, like what? <laughs> That's a narrative. So I'm actually trying to get ca caught up because I forgot to push on my slides. So, okay, so we're gonna enter the restaurant. I'm sort of thinking something different. I think that we have, you know, we're both writers. She's someone that I, sus I respect and suspect, respect. <laughs> but I am thinking like, well, what am I gonna say to sort of make my point, especially as everybody sort of standing there. And here we come to like what I really wanna talk about today. So I just say to her, uh, do you think language is mostly like an organism or a mechanism? And so an easy answer would be like, yeah, it's both. But what I would say is like, you still have to kind of make a decision whether you think it's an animal like inside of a machine, which is sort of, I'm thinking of like a RoboCop. You know, inside he's an animal, but when you see him, he looks like a machine. Or whether you're thinking that it's a machine that's kind of inside of an animal, and that's like Steve Austin. I'm waiting on the remake of the Bionic Man movie. Y'all remember the Bionic Man? I used to have a little Bionic Man toy. I don't know, Oscar, see, he had the, the eye. So all of his Bionic stuff is inside. So walking down the street, he looks like an animal, and yet inside of him are these machine parts. So what I'm suggesting is you still have to make a decision, even if you want to say a little bit of both. I'm saying for our purposes today, and really in general, that's a basic question for you yourselves to ask as you go out into the day. So I say to her, essentially that. We're talking about poems, we're talking about Ashbury, so implicitly we're talking about my work and we're talking about her work, and I say to her, do you think a poem is an animal or a machine? And then she says, really quickly, without skipping a beat, it's a machine. A thing finally wrought in language. That's what a poem is. It's a mechanism. And then I say, well, that means you think, you think a poem can be perfect. There can be a perfect poem that everybody sees and thinks it's a perfect poem. She says, yes. And her students with their little mouths and their big ears are like, yes, she's right. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, and then I say, so you believe a poet can write a poem that everyone will agree is beautiful that that poem could be written in. It's so perfect, like everybody agrees that the iPhone is pretty hot, there's a machine, like that's useful. Or the typewriter, yeah, we agree that it works. And so she says, yes, my father had a sixth grade education, I write poems he can read, I write them slowly, labor over them, because hell, if you're not playing with the big dogs, the ones who have written the perfect work, why play at all? So I think, you know, she's sort of right. Uh, anyone who chases beauty is chasing a kind of perfection. There's a great deal of validity in striving for perfect language, uh, orders for the day, orders for the universe. So this is like, you know, Benjamin Franklin ordering his day in his journal. And so it's logical, I think it's biblical, you know, God makes the world with language, let there be light. I actually thought it was, uh, Eric, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I actually thought it was, uh, in the beginning there was the word, and the word was God. But when I looked in the the, when I, I had to look it up because I don't actually have a Bible. Last night, I was like, that's not the beginning of the Bible, so I don't know where I got that from. But let's say, we know he says, let there be, let there be. So my sense of like, we think of order as a way, of language as a way to order the world, to make sense of the world. And we think of language the same way we think of uh, tools. You know, we're building things with our cranes and our hammers, these devices that we're using to bring some kind of logic to our universe. So there's really nothing wrong with thinking about language as a kind of machine, uh, the automobile, the pacemaker, those are machines. They're improved each year because the dream of perfection is a feasible one. So striving for an orderly language gives us law, blueprints, engineering. So that's Ram LZ. I don't even know who kn if people know who Ram LZ is. Uh, he actually was like a colleague of Basquiat, but you know, Basquiat got famous and he stayed in the Bronx. Um, we don't get software or code without grasping the mathematical dimensions of language. I'm not surprised y'all are not laughing. I'm like, am I not <laughs> seeing what I'm seeing? So part of that is just about, you know, technology and, and order and sensibility and squares. Um, but a machine does not run if it's incomplete. You could think about that with your computer or your phone or your telephone. Its perfection is closely related to its completeness. So what comes to mind when you think of perfect language? Certainly its capacity to communicate ideas, feelings, have something to do with it. 
Uh, but when it comes to mind, uh, do you think of a perfect sentence or a perfect word? So I love in Dream Song number 14, I have no inner resources. So that's kind of like, for me, as close as I can get to like a really perfect phrase, especially when I'm sitting in department meetings or, you know, I have no inner resources, I'm so bored. <laughs> so the poet John Berryman was a man who knew the language of chaos, depression, madness, self-destruction. So perhaps the poem captures perfect imperfections. Uh, the poet Robert Hayden was sort of the anti Berryman. Uh, I think he was like, I, I, I want to say just devout, but he believed in the Baha'i faith. I don't even know what you are if you do Baha'i, Baha'i, Baha'i men, I don't know what you would call him. Uh, shy, although he had this really, really awesome, rich voice, meditative uh, from Detroit. And so here, you know, again, another one of my drawings. If I try to sound really smart, what I'll say it is, it's like it's moving from the density of speech in the first little word cloud, which looks the most like him, to like invisible speech or whatever thought is. So the last cloud is some weird version of him. And again, I'm really just talking about that kind of progression from how we use language and what that says about us, how that acts on us. And then when we get to that empty space where he doesn't quite look like himself and all we see is an empty space, but it's not empty, it's the imagination at work as opposed to being packed in with these ideas vis-a-vis -vis like narrative and control and accessibility. Y'all following me? Uh, I'm just looking for a reason to show my pictures. <laughs> so he has this poem that uh, people love. It's one of those poems if you got a list for, certainly for poets, and I think anybody that's read a lot of poetry, if you made a list and said, let's put your 10 favorite uh, contemporary poems, you know, poems after like 1960, this poem would certainly be on a lot of those lists. So this is another one that I, I actually usually have memorized, but in front of you guys, you know, there's a little bit of pressure. But it's uh, Sundays 2, my father got up early and put on his clothes in the blue, black, cold, and then with cracked hands that ached from labor in weekday weather made bank fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking, when the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? So many people will say, yeah, that's pretty close to perfect. When you look at it, though, you can see, you know, well, that question is perfect. What did I know? What do I know? It's 14 lines, it's sort of like a sonnet, but it's not quite a sonnet if you're like really deep into scansion and prosody. So for me, the, per the, the poems are not perfect objects, they're not complete machines, they are unpredictable animals, which is to say everyone's relationship to the poem will be slightly different, um, slightly, uh, slightly nuanced. So that goes back to like, the, what's its function if it's not just to kind of create a conversation the way an animal creates a conversation, not like Siri, like Siri. I mean, you might think you're having a conversation with her, <laughs> but you're not. So uh, poets, not just poets, businessmen, uh, politicians too, everybody peddles language as if it can be controlled, except for maybe George H, George W. Bush. Maybe he, <laughs> he was never trying to control language. But most politicians, Barack Obama, uh, Hillary Clinton, I don't say the names of the other people, but are trying to like peddle a certain kind of control over language. And businessmen, if you're associated with, you need the language to be clean so that you can sell stuff, so that you can get people to trust you, so that you can get them to believe that you're competent. So that's why I'm saying, like, I understand where the idea of a machine relationship to language comes from. Uh, so my doctor, actually, after he did this, I didn't go back, but I have an appointment with him this this afternoon at two o'clock. My doctor told me after a physical, my last physical, that I was obese. So he was looking at my BMI, my body mass index. He, didn't, he wasn't joking, instead of me. So I was outraged, really, just by the use of the word. Uh, his robotic reading of the information, which would have been correct if I was like six inches taller. So it doesn't really work. The uh, BMI index report doesn't work if you're really, really short or if you're really, really tall. But all he knew is that he had looked at the number and taken the measure, you know, taken the, the weight, the body mass index, and he decided that I was obese. So I call that a lack of respect for language. <laughs> no one, <laughs> y'all shouldn't clap for that. I'm going back to him. I actually thought I would get rid of him, but I had such a hard time finding another, another doctor. 
So I missed my physical. I've been getting physicals every year. See, this is what I mean about staying on script. I've been getting physicals every year for, you know, my whole life. I didn't get one last year because I was so mad at them. <laughs> but then when I was writing this and I wrote that, I was like, oh, let me, man, let me call it, make a physical. So, uh, so thanks, Creative Mornings Pittsburgh. You got, me, you got me back in there. So no one owns language. That's what I'm trying to say. No one owns the word protuberance or styloid, which sounds like an alien with a fly sense of style. Zygomatic, frontomatic, or asshole, or flummox which is a great Scrabble word. I had another one in here too, uh, chutzpah, also an awesome Scrabble word. I play Scrabble every day in case anybody's interested. <clears throat> our culture and we ourselves pretend we can tie down language, make it do our will, and I, I don't mind this. I love the rodeo, the wrestling to tie down, to attempt to tame it, but you can see that fighting with language implies that it fights back, that it's alive. It has to be alive and fighting if it's to be tamed. We say, blue and it wants to be a mood or it wants to be the name of Beyonce's daughter. Can a word be coaxed or hammered into its pure meaning? Is there such a thing as pure meaning or pure feeling for that matter? Who should want to master a word? Can I say without offering any specific examples that to master a thing is to kill it? To strip a thing of its mystery is to kill it. A perfect house is not a house, it's a museum. And maybe a perfect language is not a language. It's an artifact or a silenced artifact. Language is a provocative animal. The words are akin to cells and teeth and bones. Sometimes it obeys us. Every now and then we say exactly what we mean or think or feel. I actually hardly ever say exactly what I mean, but I'm giving y'all the benefit of the doubt. Every, every now and again we say exactly what we mean. So yes, language can be tamed taught not to piss on the carpet, taught to roll over, but it has a self of its own, a self born of history, epistemology, and as an animal, as language, it is far from perfect and far from being perfected or mastered. And yet, graduate schools are full of people earning master's degrees in poetry and fiction and nonfiction. They actually get degrees, I have one, that says we have mastered forms of language. And I've published a couple of books, but let me tell you, I ain't master of nothing, which really tickled me. I ain't master of nothing. I think that probably means I am master of something. <laughs> the more I write, the more speechless I am made. So I just, I had gotten dressed to teach one day and then I, I got ketchup on my tie. So I just stopped, I was so upset. I just, I'm gonna draw a picture. <clears throat> so that's what I drew. I would have been a very good invisible man. Uh, sentences are akin to veins and arteries of sound, the blood of sound. So this is just here. Some of this stuff, I think you, you just know what I'm saying. This is John Coltrane's notes before he's writing A Love Supreme. So it's just something about thinking about, like, that's, pretty, that's a pretty close to perfect, really, record, like, kind of blue. And the song itself, you know, we could, I, I don't know if I think the same. Like, is there a such thing as a perfect song? We can debate. That's another talk. That's when, when Pittsburgh does music, we'll bring somebody in to talk about that. But just seeing the words written on the score says something about, again, the relationship between language and music. The inability to master language is certainly a source of deep despair and frustration. It goes without saying. And if you believe language is a machine, there can be hope. You devote yourself to usefulness, to clarity, precision, writing poems your father can understand, or poems that speak truth to power. This is if you believe it's a machine, you sort of believe that it's a tool, that it has a function, that it really can change people and change worlds. It's not that you cannot or should not master anything. It's more like, why would you want to master it? What are the consequences of actually mastering something that lives? Our nation, of course, has a long history of aspiring to mastery. We dreamed and still dream of we can master the wilds, uh, we can master the principles of democracy, we can master business, industry, technology, America the beautiful, a more perfect union, the pursuit of happiness. Some call this the dream of progress. And of course, tied up in our nation's narratives of mastery are the narratives of oppression, colonization, the mastery of people, of countries, of cultures. Even knowledge is thought of as something one can master and sell and commodify. That's a Basquiat. Since I had Ram LZ, I thought I should use Basquiat there too. Uh, so there's something about the wind in this piece by William Pope L, who's like this really interesting. They say conceptual artist, he's just like a, a very interesting artist is what I say. Uh, 
So it's something about the wind, the windshield there, and then something about the window here in these two pieces. We treat language like a machine because we believe we communicate and express, what we communicate and express can be fixed, that our contradictory selves can be fixed in a sentence or a tweet or a letter. So I think of the same notion. But you know, like if you've gotten into debates on Twitter, I don't, I'm not on Twitter, but I assume people get in debates on Twitter. Or Facebook, I used to be on Facebook, but I got into debates on Facebook, so now I don't do it. But that should tell you, again, we're using it as a kind of, we're using the technology and thinking of the language inside that technology as being comparable, but it's really not. First of all, not everybody can write. That's the first thing you realize when you're like going, I know that because I started texting with my mom last year, and I was like, she's so smart, and I'm always like, wow, that's an interesting sentence. Or just looking back over some of your own crazy posts, I think you realize, oh yeah, certainly language is doing its own thing. I thought I said what I meant, and you know, it changed, whatever the thing that changes your words is. <laughs> when you're texting, you thought you wanted to say something, and the machine wanted to say something else. To say language is an animal is to admit it cannot be fixed, and that's a good thing. It grows, evolves, dashes as we struggle to hold it, it's like the lover who wants his beloved to remain forever as she was just yesterday. She is a strange unwinding sentence made of several contradictory multiplying words, the beloved. This is my relationship to language, certainly to poems. Language is a multi-dimensional animal. It can be a source of form. It can be a source of euphoria and fucked up feeling all at once. And as we can see in this next poem I'm gonna show you, it can be a means of giving form to feeling fucked up. So that's just one of my drawings. I don't, again, know what to say about it. There's some words in there. <clears throat> so this is the last poem, and we're just about done. This is a poem by Etheridge Knight, uh, Feeling Fucked Up. Lord, she's gone, done left me, done packed up and split, and I with no way to make her come back, and everywhere the world is bare, Bright, bone, white, crystal, sand, glistens, dope, death, dead, dying, and jiving, drove her away, made her take her laughter and her smiles and her softness and her midnight sighs. Fuck cold train and music and clouds drifting in the sky. Fuck the sea and trees and the sky and birds and alligators and all the animals that roam the earth. Fuck Marx and Mao, fuck Fidel and Nkrumah and democracy and communism, fuck smack and pot and red ripe tomatoes, fuck Joseph, fuck Mary, fuck God, Jesus and all the disciples, fuck Fanon, Nixon and Malcolm, fuck the revolution, fuck freedom, fuck the whole motherfucking thing. All I want now is my woman back so my soul can sing. So I kind of have, yeah, it's a good point, right? I kind of have that at the end because I do think it's sort of, it is smart, it's not like he just sort of made it up. There is something about the way he, way he leads into it and then what the repetition does for him. So when you think about it, we are looking for a kind of a middle space, like letting the language do what it wants to do, letting it be profane, letting it be passionate, while also still having some kind of shape to it. And that's sort of my relationship to language as a poet. It's like, it is, a mach it is an animal, but I'm always trying to tame it. It's just like, you know, if you got like a, a cat, certainly, or even an ant farm, you know how hard it is to tame ants. <laughs> But it's fun. It's not like, okay, I can, I can make these ants do what I want. So that is the relationship I think a poet might have with words. Who should want to master a word? Shouldn't we want to live with it, let it speak back to us, even be mastered by it from time to time? Language is a strange, magical animal. It is the beast that takes itself and its tail mysteriously away into mountains or sea or sky, leaving behind us wag. That's it, y'all. I think that was 20 minutes. <laughs> Is there a Q&A? Oh, we don't. Okay, cool. <laughs>